okay, this is the question that is in front of us. This question is basically a mix of the topic of your uh, biological molecules and enzymes. They have mixed the two topics up. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look and talk about what the question is, right? The question is saying, starch molecules are the main storage molecules in many types of cereal grain, such as grain of barley plant. When the seed inside a barley grain germinates, genes coding for digestive enzymes are switched on. The enzymes that are synthesized catalyze the hydrolysis of storage molecules, such as proteins and starch. So first one, explain it, what, what is meant by gene. We're going to leave that because we haven't done that topic yet. Now, the second one is saying the hydrolysis of proteins in barley seeds produces amino acids that can be used in the synthesis of proteins required for the formation of the seedling. Figure 2.1 is an incomplete diagram of the molecular structure of the smallest amino acid glycine. Each molecule of glycine has two carbon atoms. The question says complete figure 2.1 to uh, complete figure 2.1 to show the molecular structure of glycine. So glycine is an amino acid, right? So in an amino acid, what are the, we have a carbon atom, if you guys remember. I had told you that we have a carbon atom. This carbon atom is attached to a hydrogen. The, and to the R group. So in cases of glycine, glycine in glycine, the R group is H. That's why I have two H. Because this is my R group. H is the R group. Okay, so I have one carbon atom with one hydrogen and one R group. Then what were the two other functional groups that I uh, that we would draw? Does anybody remember? In an, in an amino acid, in the amino acid, the structure of amino acid, does anybody remember? We would have a carbon atom. Carboxylic yeah. acid. Yes, correct. We would have, and what's the other one? And amine. Yes, the amine group. Correct. Good job, Anush. So over here, I will just make a carboxylic acid. On and this side, I will make an amine. That's it. I'm done. Next, they're saying starch is a mixture of two different molecules. Name these two molecules. Does anybody remember what are the two molecules from which starch was made up of? When I told you guys about glucose joining together, to give you your polymers, so we studied about two different structures. One was a straight chain structure and one was a branch structure. Does anybody remember what their names were? Uh, yeah, yeah. We'll do, we'll say molecules or the monomers. Uh, the molecules, not the monomers. The monomer is glucose. The monomer is glucose. The monomer is uh not asking the monomer. They're asking the molecule. If you remember, I had told you that glucose molecules join together to give you a to give you two types of molecule. One was a straight chain and one was a branch. So the straight chain structure, if you remember, was known as amylose. And the branch chain structure is amylopectin, right? That's what we had studied. So glucose is the monomer, okay? They're not asking the monomer, they're asking the molecule. So, glucose monomer will join together to give you a straight chain. If it's a straight chain, we call it amylose. And it only has one type of bond, that is 1,4 glycosidic bond. If the same glucose molecules join together in such a way that you have a branch structure, so that is known as amylopectin. And amylopectin has both 1,4 and 1,6 glycosidic bond. 
So over here, our answer is quite simple. I'm going to write down a myelose and a myelopin. That's it. That's my answer. One molecule is a myelose and the other one is a myelopectin. Okay. Continuing on, they're saying two of the enzymes synthesized by the barley seed are alpha amylase and maltase. These are involved in the hydrolysis of the stored starch during seedling formation. So we are dealing with two enzymes, alpha amylase and maltase. And they're going to help in hydrolysis, which is breakdown of the starch in the seed. In the food industry, the starch extracted from barley seeds is used in the production of sugar syrups. Figure 2.2 summarizes the reactions catalyzed by alpha amylase in the production of maltose syrup and by maltase in the production of glucose syrup. So I have starch. Starch is my polymer. Starch is my polymer. I am breaking down starch to give me maltose. And then I can break down maltose to give me Okay, so it's, this is step number one, break down starch to give us maltose. Step number two is I break down the maltose further to give me glucose. Now, question says, some of the substances shown in figure 2.2 are listed in table 2.1. Complete table 2.1 to identify which of the terms polysaccharide, monosaccharide and macromolecule apply to each of the substances listed. Let's start with groups. Is glucose a polysaccharide, a monosaccharide or a macromolecule? What do you think? What is glucose? Aruch, what do you think? Is glucose monosaccharide, polysaccharide, or a macromolecule? Sir, so, uh, monosaccharide? Yes, correct. 100% correct. It's a monosaccharide. Okay. So, this is a monosaccharide. Fine. What about maltase? And keep in mind that it is maltase. This is maltase. This. Do you think maltase is a polysaccharide, monosaccharide, or is it a macromolecule? Yes, neither. Uh, you, uh, like it's none of them. You think it? Uh, the, none of them we can select over here. Yeah. Okay. So you are uh right in the sense that we have a uh, maltase. So maltase, as you would know, maltase is what? Maltase is an enzyme, right? Since maltase is an enzyme, so most definitely it's not a monosaccharide and it's not a polysaccharide, right? That we can instantly go ahead and we can uh, root these out. It's not a monosaccharide. It's not a polysaccharide because maltase is an enzyme. And we have studied that enzymes are what? Enzymes are all protein, right? All enzymes are protein. And specifically when we talked about enzymes, we said that enzymes have a tertiary structure generally. And they are globular proteins, right? That's what we had studied. That they are tertiary, um, that uh, they are tertiary uh, have a tertiary structures and that they are globular proteins. So since enzymes are proteins, we can automatically go ahead and cut out and we can say that we are most definitely not dealing with either a polysaccharide or a monosaccharide, right? So that's fine. That's all well and good. Now, when we talk about a macromolecule, is it not going to be a macromolecule? So it's most definitely not a monopolysaccharide. It's most definitely not a monosaccharide. But is it a macromolecule? The thing is that it is a macromolecule. It actually is a macromolecule. Because what is a macromolecule? Any molecule uh, that has, uh, th that is, um, 
any molecule that is large in size, right? So we have that protein chain that has undergone primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. So that protein chain is now a macromolecule. It is now a macromolecule. It now has a uh, it now has a tertiary structure. So you are right partially that it's not a polysaccharide, it's not a monosaccharide, but it is a macromolecule. Okay. Now let's go over the next one. That is a uh, maltose. What do you think? Is maltose a polysaccharide, monosaccharide, or is it a macromolecule? What do you think? Aruj, do you think maltose is a polysaccharide, monosaccharide, or is it a macromolecule? Padija, what do you think? Is polysaccharide. Uh, okay. You are right. It's not monosaccharide and it's not a macromolecule. But it's also not a polysaccharide. Because a polysaccharide generally consists of around uh, 10 uh, 10 monomers, okay? If you have more than 10 monomers, so in that case, we call it a poly polysaccharide, okay? Remember this. So if I have just one glucose or if I have just one unit, that's a monomer, right? So glucose is a monomer. Now, what happens if I join two of your uh, monomers together? Just two, right? So, if I have one single monomer, like glucose, that is known as monosaccharide. And your examples of monosaccharides include glucose, fructose, like galactose. Right? Now, what happens if I have two monomers? If I have two monomers, it is called a disaccharide. It's called a disaccharide. And you have three disaccharides in your syllable. We have maltose. Maltose is when glucose will combine with glucose. Then you have fructose. Sorry, I said fructose. I meant lactose. Lactose is when glucose combines with fructose. And then we have sucrose, which is going to be, uh, when you're going to go ahead and talk about it, sucrose is the last disaccharide that we have. And, sorry, sucrose is made up of glucose and fructose. Sucrose is glucose and fructose. Lactose is glucose and galactose. Okay? So, over here, technically speaking, our even though we have more than one monomer, but maltose is not technically a polysaccharide. It's a disaccharide. Okay? It's not a polysaccharide. It's a disaccharide. So, we have monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose. We have disaccharides, maltose, lactose, and sucrose. And then if we have uh, the number of uh, monomers are between 2 and 10, so generally, or 2 and 8 or 2 and 10, we have another term. These molecules or these carbohydrates who have 2 to 10 glucose or who have 2 to 10 monomers, we call them oligosaccharides. And finally, if I have more than 10 or if I have more than 8, then I'm going to call them polysaccharides, okay? So, if I have just one single glucose, that's a monosaccharide. If I have two of them, so in maltose, it's two of them, right? Because I'm breaking down maltose to give me glucose. 
That's what I'm doing. I'm breaking down maltose to give me glucose. Glucose is a monosaccharide. When I join two monosaccharides with each other, I will get a disaccharide. Then that disaccharide is going to give me a, uh, uh, if more than 10 of them will join together with each other, that's when I get a polysaccharide. So in this case, maltose is none of them. It's most definitely not a macromolecule, but it's not a monosaccharide or a polysaccharide. It's actually a disaccharide. I hope that's making sense. Let me know if there is any confusion at all. Finally, we have starch. What do you think starch is? Do you think starch is a polysaccharide, monosaccharide, or macromolecule? Polysaccharide? Polysaccharide. Yes, yes starch is the polysaccharide, correct. So in polysaccharides in your syllabus, you are uh, dealing with, um, you have, in the topic of polysaccharides, you have uh, glycogen, starch, and cellulose. All right, these are all polysaccharides. And you have to remember that glycogen and starch are made up of amylose and amylopectin. Amylose is straight chain. Amylopectin is a branch structure. Cellulose is also a straight chain structure, but it's made from beta groups. Glycogen and starch are both made from alpha groups. Right, so we have monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose. We have disaccharides, maltose, lactose, sucrose. Then more than 10 monomers is polysaccharide, which is glycogen, starch, and cellulose. Both glycogen and starch are made of amylose and amylopectin and alpha glucose. Cellulose is made up of beta groups. Okay. Now, after that, they're saying when producing sugar syrups, their advantage is in using enzymes extract from microorganisms. For example, some enzymes extracted from microorganisms are heat stable. Heat stable enzymes are used to increase productivity because the reactions can be carried out at higher temperatures. Suggest so one another advantage of using enzymes obtained from microorganisms rather than enzymes extracted from barley seeds in the production of sugar syrup. So they are basically saying that if I am getting an enzyme from a microorganism, it's going to be heat stable. The enzymes we get from microorganisms are heat stable, right? Heat stable enzymes are used to increase productivity because, of course, they're heat stable. So even if the temperature increases, even if we are doing it at a high temperature, we are still going to be able to utilize that enzyme for the reaction because it's a heat stable enzyme right so what this is the first and this is an advantage this is one major advantage because it's heat stable so that we can go ahead and carry out reactions at high temperature they're saying this is one this is one advantage one advantage they've already provided you that we can use it to carry out reactions at high temperature now they're saying, please tell us another advantage besides this one. Tell us one another advantage of using enzymes that we are getting from microorganisms compared to, you know, barley seeds. What do you guys think? Can you guys just think of any reason why it's better to go for an enzyme that we get from microorganism as compared to going and getting it from a seed? Take your time, think about it. What could be the possible advantage of using enzymes from a microorganism compared to a seed?
I can give you, I can start you off. There are actually a few advantages. You only have to do one. Um, one clear advantage is that microorganisms can be cultured in huge quantities, right? You guys know that microorganisms are what? Your bacteria, your viruses, right? Your bacteria, if you talk about it, if I decide to grow bacteria, I can grow millions of bacteria really quickly because bacteria reproducing was really, really, really fast. We know that germs and microorganisms, they grow so fast. So I can culture these microorganisms in huge quantities and obtain huge quantities of that enzyme. If I'm using barley seeds, then obviously the amount of barley seeds I can use is limited, right? But with microorganisms, I just need to culture them. That's it. And they will grow by themselves. And they will divide and I will get huge quantities of the microorganism. So I can also get huge quantities of enzymes. Can you guys think of anything? Uh, anything that I should add? Any other advantage? It's heat stable. Think about that. Since it's heat stable, so it will be active over a range of temperature. Right, it's not going to be just active at optimum temperature. It's not going to be acting just at the optimum temperature. It's going to be active over a range of temperature, especially greater range of temperature. That's the important thing, right? It will be active over a greater range of temperature. Another important point, think of it this way. If I can do my reaction at higher temperatures, it provides me a very important advantage. What advantage does it provide? It increases my rate of reaction. Because remember, temperature and rate of reaction are directly linked. If I increase the temperature, my reaction gets faster. So at higher temperatures, my rate of reaction will increase. So by using this enzyme, I can do carry out uh, uh, reactions at higher temperatures and as a result my rate of reaction will be higher as well. So that's an advantage for me. And another thing is that enzymes from microorganisms are easier to extract. Right? Much easier to take out enzymes from microorganisms as compared to a barley seed, which will have to undergo a lot of different processes. I will have to break it down. I will have to break down the cells. Then I can get the enzyme. It's much easier to do that with microorganisms. So these are some of the advantages that I could think of. If you guys have any more in your mind, let me know. But you have to give any one of these. So any one of these would be acceptable. After that, they say figure 2.3 is a graph showing how the activity of alpha amylase extracted from barley seeds changes as the temperature increases from 10 degrees centigrade to 66 degrees centigrade. Okay, so we have a graph that is showing us effect of enzyme uh, temperature or enzyme activity. Question says, explain the effect of temperature on the activity of alpha amylase extracted from barley seeds as shown in figure 2.3. Okay, in these type of questions, you will see two kinds of two types of terms. You will either see that they have given you a graph, and after giving you a graph, they have written either the term explain or the term describe. If they say describe the effect, so that is relatively easier. Because they just want you to describe the graph. That's it. Right? Describe the effect. Whenever they use the term describe the effect or describe the graph, all they want you to do is talk about the graph. So you can say, okay, from here to here, the temperature was increasing. And this was the optimum temperature. Then after that, the temperature started to decrease again. That is description. I'm just telling about the graph. I'm just explaining the graph. Not explaining the graph. I'm just... Uh, describing what I can see. 
So I can see that the temperature increases, which is an optimum temperature. This is the optimum temperature. All of that, that is description. Then they will say explain. Yes. That first of all, you have to do a small description of the graph, a small few lines on what you can see in the graph, and then the explanation as to why you see it. Right? So over here, the question says explain. So we have to explain why this is happening to the enzyme. Why is it that what I what, what I can see the graph? Why is it happening to the enzyme? Uh, go ahead, take a few minutes, just take a look at the graph. And then let's go ahead and discuss the answer. Okay, let's go ahead and discuss what what uh, how we should answer it. So in questions like these, the first thing you want to do is start with a small description. Not a detailed description, but a small description about what we can see in the graph. What do we see in the graph? What do you guys think? What, what should I say? The temperature. So what happens as the temperature increases? What happens as the temperature increases? What do you guys think? What's happening to the enzyme activity? Uh, 
uh, Anuj, what do you think I should what do you think I should say about the enzyme activity? As I'm increasing the temperature, what's happening to the enzyme activity? Percent increases. Yes, you're right. Percentage enzyme activity increases. And then what happens? So it increases and then it reaches a peak value. Do you know what this what is this peak value that we have over here? As the temperature increases, percentage enzyme activity increases until, until what? Let's read from the graph, right? Until we are at about uh, 48 degrees centigrade, right? So what do you think is the 48 degrees centigrade? What should I call it? What should I say? Because this is the temperature at which the enzyme activity is maximum, right? So what is that temperature called at which the enzyme activity becomes maximum? What is that temperature called at which we have maximum enzyme activity? We call that temperature optimum temperature right so we will have reached optimum temperature so after you reach the optimum temperature as we increase the temperature the enzyme activity increases after 48 degrees centigrade the enzyme activity decreases as the temperature increases so that's an description that's it one small line, or not that small, one long line, but that's your description. After adding a small description of the graph, now you have to actually explain. Now, let's explain why. Why is it that, okay, let's start with the first part. As the temperature increases, the percentage enzyme activity increases until you reach the optimum temperature. Can you explain why? Why is it that the uh, enzyme activity increases as I increase the temperature? What do you think, Aruj? Like, what would be the reason? What do you think? What could the possible reason be? The reason why that is happening is because when I increase the temperature, the kinetic energy of the molecule increases, right? The kinetic energy of the enzymes increase. Hence, the enzymes move faster. Enzymes start to move faster. Hence, there are more collisions, more successful collisions. So that is why enzyme activity increases, right? Because there will be more successful collisions between the substrate and your enzyme. So since there's more collisions taking place, there's going to be, there's going to be, uh, the rate of reaction or the activity of enzyme will increase. Now, after 48 degrees centigrade, the enzyme activity starts to decrease. Why? Why is it that the activity starts to decrease? We studied for that. It is because of denaturation 
of the enzyme. After 48 degrees centigrade, the enzyme starts to denature. Why is it denaturing? Because the temperature is disrupting the hydrogen bonds, the disulfide bonds, right? Your disulfide bonds, your hydrogen bonds, um, or even if you don't want to talk about the disulfide bonds, your hydrogen bonds, uh, for example, are going to be disrupted. And because of disruption of the hydrogen bonds, ionic bonds, and so on and so forth, what's going to happen? The shape of the active site will be distorted, right? That's what happens. The shape of the active site gets distorted. And as a result, what will happen? The enzyme will no longer bind to substrate. Hence, enzyme activity. So that is the answer that you're going to give in this slide. Okay. After that, they are saying, sketch on figure 2.3 the curve that would be obtained using alpha amylase, that is heat stable. So they're saying that we have an enzyme that is heat stable, right? What will the graph look like? So what the graph is going to look like is this. That you are going to see an optimum peak, maximum activity at a much higher temperature, right? My enzyme's optimum temperature will be higher because my enzyme is heat stable. Because my enzyme is heat stable, because my enzyme is able to withstand high temperatures, so the optimum activity of the enzyme is going to be, uh, optimum temperature is going to be higher. My enzyme is going to give me 100% activity at a higher temperature because it's a heat stable enzyme. So my graph is going to look something like this. One second. Right? And you can see I've made a broader graph as well, right? Over here, my graph is broader. The reason my graph is broader is because my enzyme can work at a range of temperatures, okay? My enzyme can work at a range of temperatures. Since my enzyme can work over a range of temperatures, so it will be heat stable even at higher temperature, right? Even at higher temperature, it's going to be heat stable. So your curve is going to look something like this. Uh, making sense? Any confusion, Khadija Aruj? All clear about this question that we just discussed? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. Let's go ahead and take up another question on our topic. Give me a second. Let me just share with you. This is a question. Figure 2.1 shows three molecules of water. Describe the hydrogen bonding that occurs between water molecules. So hydrogen bonding is something that is studied in chemistry as well, right? So you simply have to describe your hydrogen bonding, what it is. Take one minute, think about all the points you should include and then let's start.
guys, how can we answer this? What points do you guys think I should go ahead and include over here? Um, that hydrogen will be covalently bonded to lower pairs of oxygen. Okay, so we have hydrogen covalently bonded to oxygen, right? And then. What else should I say? So we are going to go ahead and first of all, they're saying describe the hydrogen bonding that occurs between water. So describe always means we try to describe what we can see. So you and I can see that there are weak hydrogen bonds. And you guys know how you can see that their hydrogen bonds are weak because they have shown the hydrogen bonds with the dotted line. Right? The covalent bonds are a thick line. The hydrogen bonds are dotted line. So first thing that the diagram shows us is that the hydrogen bonds are the second thing that the diagram is showing us is that the hydrogen bonds are forming between your electronegative oxygen and partial electronegative oxygen and partial positive hydrogen, right? Along with that, you are going to go ahead and say each oxygen atom makes two hydrogen bonds. Can you see one atom, uh, one bond that you're getting is over here and one bond is over here. So each oxygen atom makes two hydrogen bonds, right? So we start first of all by explaining that hydrogen bonds are weak bonds. Then we are going to talk about how the bonds are formed between a uh, partial negative oxygen and partial positive hydrogen. And how each oxygen atom is going to be making two hydrogen bonds, right? Along with that, another thing that you guys will notice is that, uh, so um, water molecule is dipolar, right? So water molecule is dipolar because it has got two dipoles. One is from the partial positive hydrogen to partial uh, negative oxygen. And the other one is from partial positive hydrogen to partial negative oxygen. So water is a dipolar molecule with two dipoles. The hydrogen bond forms between partial negative oxygen and partial positive hydrogen. They are weak bonds and each oxygen atom is attached to two hydrogen atoms or it has made hydrogen bond with two water molecules. So these are the points you will add. Next they say the human enzyme salivary amylase is composed of one polypeptide. Figure 2.2 represents the structure of a molecule of salivary amylase. So this is the structure of salivary amylase. Okay. Explain the role of hydrogen bonding in maintaining the secondary structure of proteins such as salivary amylase. What do you think? It's just a one mark question. So you don't have to um, give a detailed answer to it. It's a one mark question. So keeping it simple, what do you think? What is the role of hydrogen bonding in maintaining the secondary structure of proteins?
what should I say? What do you guys think? In secondary structure, we studied about two types of structures. What were they? We had alpha helix and we had beta theta sheets. That's all you have to say. It's a one mark question. This is literally a one mark question. So you don't need to go into details with your answer. All you have to say is that hydrogen bonding is needed to maintain the alpha helical and the beta beta structure of the protein. That's it. Next, they're saying, explain the role of hydrogen bonding in maintaining the tertiary structure of proteins, such as salivary amylase. What is the role of hydrogen bonding in maintaining the tertiary structure of proteins? What do you guys think? What should I say? What, how does hydrogen bonding maintain a tertiary structure? So, okay, if you remember, I told you guys that the hydrogen bonds in tertiary structure exist between the R groups, remember? So we have hydrogen bonds. We have hydrogen bonds between the R groups and the carboxyl and amine. Right? These hydrogen bonds help to stabilize and further fold the protein. To further fold your protein, that is going to uh, uh, that is going to uh, give it further fold the protein to make it globular and determine the shape of atoms. Uh, uh, the shape of atoms. Right. So that's how we can go ahead and answer this particular question. Now, uh, in the topic of enzymes, you will see that quite a lot of your questions are actually mixed in. Uh, with the topic of proteins. Genetics as well. Genetics and your topic of proteins are actually quite mixed up with each other. These questions of proteins and all eventually, uh, you know, you once you practice enough of them, they start to make sense, right? That, that, that's not the problem with it. The um, questions get slightly confusing when we talk about your uh, uh, your um, MCQ questions, right? Because in MCQ questions, especially, they ask you a lot about the Michelin constant and all that. That's where it gets a bit tricky. The question says, which graph directly shows the activation energy of an enzyme reaction when an enzyme is added? So we have a, uh, we have this particular situation. Now, in option A, we can clearly see that when we don't have any enzyme, the, um, uh, okay, in option A, they are saying, in option A, they are saying, this is the product and this is the reactant. Okay, that's what they're saying in option A. Now, this doesn't really make any sense. The reactant should be over here and product should be over here. So let's say that we can, for example, for now, let's say we rule out option A. What about option B? In option B, if you take a look, so reactants are here and products are here. So reaction is going the correct way from reactant to product, that's fine. Over here, they have shown us that there is no enzyme, so there is a high activation energy. And when enzyme is added, our activation energy is much lower. But you will see that the labeling for activation energy is not correct. This is an example of endothermic reaction, right? If we follow chemistry, 
endothermic reaction, if you remember the labeling in endothermic reaction, the activation energies from the peak to the reactant, the peak of the graph of the reactant. So if you follow chemistry, then this should be the activation energy, not what they have labeled. But let's take a look at the other options. In our option C, again, we can take a look over here that our products are at the bottom and reactants are on the other side. And also, quite incorrectly, their activation energy is not labeled correctly at all. This is not the activation energy. This is not what actually activation energy is. So option C is most definitely not correct. If we take a look at option D, so in option D, you're going to see that the reaction is going from reactant to product. Fine, the order is correct. We're going from reactant to product. And this is an exothermic reaction. Activation energy is from the bottom, the reactant, to the peak, right? That's what activation energy is. From the reactant to your peak. So over here, I told you guys that even though the reaction, the uh, rest of the graph is fine, the labeling of activation energy is incorrect because the activation energy is from the reactant to the peak. Over here, the activation energy is correctly labeled. This is an example of exothermic reaction. It's correctly labeled. It's going from reactant to the peak. So our answer over here turns out to be option D. Option D is the correct answer. Making sense how we're solving the question? Yes. Arush, making sense? Yes, yes. Okay, guys, we'll go ahead and stop it. We're